For those who are sitting on park benches in the warm spring sunlight, for those who are huddling in shelters trying to escape the rain, for those who are walking the streets in the all but futile search for work, for those who think that there is no hope for the future, no recognition of their plight, this little paper is addressed. It is printed to call their attention to the fact that the Catholic worker, Catholic Church has a social program to let them know that there are men of God who are working not only for their spiritual, but for their material welfare. She'd sought no authorization uh, from the hierarchy before launching this paper. She had no clerical advisor or board of directors. She herself was a convert of only six years, an unwed single mother with fairly limited Catholic converts, uh, contacts, and no theological education beyond her reading of the lives of the saints. And yet in the midst of the depression, she perceived the need for a new Catholic voice, one that would relate the gospel to the plight of the poor and the struggle for social justice. And she undertook on her own initiative to provide that voice. By the time of her death, nearly 50 years later, Dorothy Day was widely regarded as the radical conscience of the American Catholic Church. But it was not always so. For most of her life, she was a fairly marginal figure, far outside the mainstream, operating without any official support or recognition from the church hierarchy, unfamiliar to most readers of the Catholic press. As a convert to Catholicism, she remained quite traditional in her religious practice. She attended Mass each day. As a Benedictine oblate, she prayed from a breviary. And she was never without her rosary. Steeped in the lives of the saints, her everyday speech and writing were filled with references to figures like St. Augustine, St. Francis, St. Teresa of Avila. And yet there was something quite different about her, different from almost anyone who came before, because she consciously combined her traditional faith with a radical approach to social and political issues. This was a conjunction of attitudes that, that essentially didn't exist before Dorothy Day came along. Together with other radicals, she marched in demonstrations, walked on picket lines, and was regularly arrested for acts of civil disobedience, the last time when she was 75. Like many of the saints she revered, she spent her life in active service to the poor. But she didn't stop with charity and the works of mercy. She joined the practice of charity with a passion for social justice. She believed it was not enough to feed the poor, but we must ask why they are poor. We must analyze and expose and resist those structures and ideologies and institutional forces that give rise to the poverty and the need for so much charity. At the same time, she differed from the type of radical who specializes merely in denouncing the world as it is. Like a true prophet, she combined denunciation of the world's injustice with annunciation of a new world, of forgiveness, solidarity, and compassion. And she bore witness to the possibility of that world in her daily living. She believed the modern world was in need of a new kind of saint who could combine the dimensions of body and spirit, the historical and the transcendent, the political and the mystical, this world and the next. We couldn't get to heaven merely by worrying about our own souls. She liked to say, God would always say, where are the others? The Catholic Worker was the name of a newspaper which sells today as it did 75 years ago for a penny a copy. The Catholic Worker is also the name of a lay Catholic movement that has attempted to show how the radical gospel commandment of love can be lived. G.K. Chesterton famously said that Christianity has not been, not been tried and failed. It has been found difficult and not tried. Dorothy was someone who set out to disprove that statement. Nobody who had met her could ever say that the gospel had not been tried. As a result, some people called her a communist. Such criticism didn't really bother her very much. She liked to say that it was the complacency of, of Christians in her youth that had made her love the communists, and the communists uh, with their love of the poor in turn who led her to Christ. For his part, J. Edgar Hoover, who was director of the FBI, said, Dorothy Day is a very erratic and irresponsible person. She's engaged in activities which strongly suggest that she is consciously or unconsciously being used by communist groups. 
From past experience with her, it is obvious she maintains a very hostile and belligerent attitude toward the Bureau and makes every effort to castigate the FBI whenever she feels so inclined. <laughs> this was part of the voluminous uh, FBI file on the Catholic worker that I have obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. When I um, read this aloud to her, she was kind of uh, delighted and said, that it makes me sound like a mean old woman, doesn't it? <laughs> On the other hand, many people called her a saint, which was another matter. When they call you a saint, she often said, it means basically that you're not to be taken seriously. To be called a saint, she feared, was a way of being dismissed. You know, Dorothy can do this, after all, she's a saint. It implied that what would have been difficult for other people was somehow easy for her. No one knew as well as she did how much she had paid for her vocation. As she said, uh, neither revolutions nor faith is one without keen suffering. For me, Christ was not to be bought for 30 pieces of silver, but with my heart's blood. And yet today the church has initiated the cause for Dorothy's canonization, a cause that I've supported, believing that she embodied the type of holiness that is so necessary for our time, a holiness that is not concerned with its own purity or perfection, but empties itself to confront the burning issues of our time, poverty, violence, the desecration of nature, the meaning of work, the yearning for freedom and peace. Dorothy Day was born in Brooklyn 113 years ago on November 8, 1897, just past her birthday. She grew up in Chicago. Her father was a newspaper man, actually a, a sports writer. Although she was brought up in a nominally Christian home, from an early age, she grew disillusioned by the failure of Christians as she sought to do anything to change the world. In her autobiography, there is a significant passage where she describes her first childhood encounters with the lives of the saints. She recalls how her heart was stirred by the stories of their charity toward the sick, the maimed, the lepers. But there was another question in my mind, she notes. Why was so much done in remedying the evil instead of avoiding it in the first place? Where were the saints to try to change the social order, not just to minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery? After dropping out of college, she moved to New York, where she spent her youth working on various radical journals and uh, leading, lending her efforts to the struggle for a new social order. Her friends included anarchists, communists, anti-war activists, and assorted literary bohemians, including the playwright Eugene O'Neill, who was a particular friend. She was arrested a couple of times, and including in one case for picketing in front of the White House as part of a women's suffrage uh, protest. Uh, there was a certain excitement to all of this engagement in her early life, but her life was also at this time marked by a deep sense of loneliness and a kind of moral and spiritual confusion. There was always in Dorothy Day a yearning for the transcendent, that distinguished her from her companions. One of them later remarked that she was too religious to be a communist. The turning point in her life began some years later. She was living on Staten Island with a man named Forster Batterham, whom she deeply loved. He was an agnostic with anarchist sympathies, and a great lover of nature, and he helped awaken in Dorothy, who was essentially a city girl, a great uh, appreciation for natural beauty and the miracle of creation. Dorothy called this time in her life a period of natural happiness. I was happy, she said, but my very happiness made me know that there was a greater happiness to be obtained from life than in, I, than in any I had ever known. I began to think, to weigh things more, and it was, it was at this time that I began consciously to pray. It was also at this time that Dorothy discovered that she was pregnant, an event that was f fraught with significance for her. An earlier tragic love affair had ended in her having an abortion. For some time, she believed she couldn't have children. Now in her pregnancy, she experienced such joy and an impulse of gratitude so large that it could only be directed to God. Before long, she found herself wishing to have her child baptized in the Catholic Church, a step she would eventually follow, though it meant a wrenching separation from Forster, who would have nothing to do with marriage. It also seemed initially to involve a painful betrayal of the working class. She believed the Catholic Church was the home of the poor. As her father put it, it was the 
Church of Irish Cops and Washerwomen. But to her radical friends, and sadly to her as well, it seemed more like a friend of the status quo, the ultimate uh, defender of, of the privileged. She was literally at a loss about how to reconcile her faith and her loyalty to the cause of the oppressed. <coughs> After her baptism in 1927, she spent the next five years in a kind of wilderness, praying to find some way of re reconciling her two loves. The answer came in December 1932 with her introduction to Peter Morin, an itinerant French peasant philosopher who simply showed up one day at her apartment. Peter Morin was 20 years older than Dorothy, and frankly, something of a character. Although he was accustomed to hard manual labor, he lived almost entirely in the realm of ideas. Those who gave him the time of day and were willing to overlook his shabby appearance and his thick accent might recognize his genius and holiness. But even Dorothy later had to ask herself whether she really liked him. Nevertheless, the meeting between Dorothy Day and Peter Morin is surely one of the great uh, moments in the history of the American Catholic Church. The country at this time was in the throes of the Depression, and Peter believed the problems with the world were not ultimately economic or political, but spiritual. They came from making the bank account rather than the Sermon on the Mount the center of all values. As a result, Christians did not recognize Christ in their neighbors. The Catholic Church, he believed, had a radical message, a message of dynamite, but most church authorities preferred to seal it up. His aim, he said, was to blow the dynamite. That could get you in trouble, that kind of language today. But. Dorothy immediately seized on the practical aspects of Peter's vision. She set out at once to start a newspaper to propagate the social implications of the gospel. This was followed shortly by a house of hospitality, a center for practicing the works of mercy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, clothing the naked. Not in the manner of, a, of an impersonal social agency, but in a spirit of personal responsibility. It clearly wasn't a solution to the vast problems of the Depression, but it showed a determination to put ideals into action. And so the Catholic Worker was launched on May 1st, 1933. Before meeting Peter Morin, Dorothy had prayed to find some way of achieving what she called a synthesis, reconciling body and soul, this world and the next. She was right to be confounded about which way to turn. None of the existing options reflected her particular sense of vocation, and so she invented her own way. Dorothy always gave credit to Peter Morin for supplying the ideas behind the Catholic worker. He provided her with what he called a Catholic view of history and a personalist philosophy to replace the class struggle perspective of her radical past. But before meeting Dorothy Day, Peter Morin had been uh, singularly incapable of translating his ideas onto a scale larger than himself. I think Peter's major contribution was simply to give Dorothy permission to launch her own movement. Drawing on the lives of the saints, he showed that it was not necessary to wait for anyone to authorize or sponsor the way of discipleship. The saints began immediately with whatever was at hand. If God blessed their venture, the means would arrive. For Dorothy, this meant starting a newspaper with no money, calling it the Catholic worker without seeking prior permission from the bishop or any other authority, daring to offer a Catholic perspective on social issues that was far in advance of contemporary social uh, teaching. At that time, what was called Catholic action was defined as participation of the laity in the apostolate of the bishops. But the Catholic worker was something completely new, a religious community of lay people organized under no rule, with no formal accountability to religious authorities, determined to live out their faith in response to the urgent social needs of the day. Certainly many people, conservatives and liberals alike, were confounded by Day's ability to integrate a very traditional Catholic faith style of piety with a radical style of social engagement. But there was no paradox in her eyes. Her life was simply rooted in a sense of the radical implications of the Incarnation. The fact that God had entered our flesh and our history, and so what we did for our neighbors, we did directly for Him. It was ultimately the Incarnation, the central doctrine of Christianity, that showed the way toward that synthesis she had been seeking, the key to reconciling the spiritual and the material 
the love of God and the love of neighbor, body and soul, this world and the next. This strong incarnational faith was the thread that united the various aspects of her life, her embrace of voluntary poverty and a life in community among the poor, her practice of the works of mercy, her prayer and commitment to the sacramental life of the church, her staunch commitment to social justice, her seamless garment approach to the protection of life, and her commitment to gospel nonviolence. Because of the incarnation, God had left the imprint of divinity all around us. All life was hallowed. God was present in our neighbors, especially in the disguise of those in need. This was the meaning of that famous passage in the Gospel of Matthew that was pretty much the motto of the Catholic worker. I was hungry and you fed me. I was homeless and you sheltered me. You know, what you did for the least of my brethren, you did for me. This meant we didn't have to worry about what we would have done for Christ if we had lived 2,000 years ago. Whatever we should have done then, we could do now. She believed in the real presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine on the, on the altar, but she believed that Christ was equally present in the poor, and so our response to the poor was a test of the authenticity of our worship. How could we love God whom we haven't seen if we haven't loved our neighbor whom we have seen? And how could we love our neighbor who is hungry without feeding him or her? The mystery of the poor is this, she said, that they are Jesus, and what you do for them, you do to him. And so the doctrine of the Incarnation led directly to the practice of the works of mercy, serving God in the encounter with the neighbor. This incarnational or sacramental sense had concrete social implications, not just in her response to poverty, but in a more controversial way in her response to war. If Christ was present in the disguise of our neighbor, this was also true in his most terrible disguise, in the face of the one who is called our enemy. It was Dorothy's conviction that Jesus had come to offer a radical new definition of love as the ultimate law of our lives. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It was a new commandment, for the love exemplified on the cross extended beyond friends and those who were on our side or those who were lovable. Jesus had left us a definition of nonviolence, not only in his words, but in the manner of his life. By his death and resurrection, he had converted the cross, a sign of defeat, into a symbol of life and hope, and he had come to substitute the cross for the sword or the bomb as an effective instrument of liberation and justice. Dorothy Day's pacifist convictions were first tested during the Spanish Civil War, a war many, if not most Catholics, regarded as a crusade in defense of the church. Her response was grounded in the Gospels, the fact that when Christ himself was threatened with death, he told his disciples to put away their swords. This stance was enough to brand her as a marginal figure in the eyes of most Catholic, American Catholics, and subscriptions to the Catholic worker plummeted. The movement was more dramatically divided when she maintained her pacifist position throughout World War II. After Pearl Harbor, many of her closest supporters parted ways. Subscriptions plummeted, many houses closed. But even here, in the case of an apparently just cause, she rooted her stand in the gospel. If we could take liberties with Christ's relentless insistence on the way of love, how could we claim to base clear doctrine or moral teaching on any other of his hard teachings. The way of the gospel was true folly in the eyes of the world, but we were not told to love up to the point of reason, prudence, or personal safety, but to love unreasonably, foolishly, profligately, unto the cross, unto death. By the end of the war, in battling evil, the Allies thought nothing of devastating whole cities from the air. In Tokyo alone, at the end of the war, 100,000 people were burned to death. And finally, there was the dropping of the atomic bombs, a weapon that foreshadowed the possible destruction of all life on Earth. In the era of nuclear weapons, she believed, the teaching of indiscriminate love had become a practical necessity, an imperative. To live under the canopy of such weapons without resisting or raising an outcry was, in her view, to participate in the ultimate blasphemy.
Over the years, the Catholic worker sponsored numerous protests against the dangers of nuclear war and for her own refusal to cooperate with New York City's annual compulsory civil defense drills in the 1950s, she served several jail terms. She did not expect great things to happen overnight. She knew the slow pace by which change and new life comes. It was in the phrase she repeated often, by little and by little that we are saved. And yet she acted out of deep faith in the mystical bonds of cause and effect in which we are all connected. Any act of love or compassion might contribute to the balance of love in the world. Any sufferings endured in love might ease the burden of others. We could only make use of the little things we possessed, the, the little faith, the little strength, the little hope, the little courage. All these were just the loaves and fishes, and we could only offer what we had and pray that God would make the increase. I met Dorothy Day 35 years ago in 1975. I had, as Richard mentioned, taken a leave from college after my sophomore year and made my way down to the Catholic Worker, hoping to learn something directly about life apart from books and planned to stay only a few months. But I was pretty quickly hooked and ended up remaining five years, which were the last year, five years of Dorothy's life. Our first meeting uh, took place in the uh, kitchen at St. Joseph's House on First Street. Dorothy took pride in the occasion when she was mistaken for one of the homeless women on the Bowery. She dressed in clothes that were donated to the Catholic worker, but there was no mistaking the authority that she carried. And to be honest, I was a little intimidated uh, at the age of 19. Knowing the, the importance of first impressions, I had spent a good deal of time trying to, to imagine what would be the, the ideal, impressive kind of uh, opening question for her. Um, but when the moment came, all I could think of, I was kind of deer caught in the headlights, and I, I said, how do you reconcile Catholicism and anarchism? And uh, she just kind of squinted at me with her uh, characteristic, bemused expression, and said, it's never been a problem for me. <laughs> uh, lacking a follow-up question, <laughs> I had no choice but to withdraw and ponder her answer for a while wondering if they contained some deep Zen meaning. Over time, I came to realize that Dorothy just wasn't into uh, abstract questions very much. But she was actually a very social and approachable person, and it wasn't difficult to get to know her. She was a great storyteller. She could spin fascinating tales about the Catholic worker, and her comrades in the radical struggle, or poignant details from the life of Chekhov, or Tolstoy, or St. Therese. She was in turn endlessly fascinated by other people's story, where they came from, who they knew, what they liked to read. Um, what's your favorite novel by Dostoevsky, which is one of her favorite uh, conversation openers. And whether you said you know, the brothers Karamazov or Crime and Punishment, or she'd say, exactly, I totally agree with you. <laughs> a few months after my arrival, Dorothy asked me to become the managing editor of the paper. She was, as she liked to say, in retirement, and the day-to-day -day management of the paper and the household were in the hands of those she called the young people. At 20, I certainly qualified as young. I, I wasn't actually even a Catholic at the time. My selection evidently had little to do with any qualifications, so much as the fact that no one else was particularly interested in the job. I think. <laughs> but Dorothy liked some articles I'd written about Gandhi, and she had faith in people, and she was able to make them feel her faith as well. She really had an uncanny ability to discern people's hidden gifts and talents, gifts that were hidden even from themselves. And I certainly couldn't imagine at that point that she was pointing me in the direction of my life's work and vocation. She was fastidious and cultivated in her tastes. She loved classical music and the opera, literature, flowers, beautiful things. And I remember how she covered the walls of her Roman Mary house with picture postcards, icons and paintings, but also pictures from nature, forests, oceans, icebergs. One time when I was in jail, she sent me one of these postcards, which was an aerial photo of Cape Cod with the inscription, I hope this card refreshes you and does not tantalize you. <laughs> she loved to quote Dostoevsky's words, the world will be saved by beauty.
But for all the sadness and suffering around her, she always had an eye for the transcendent. There were always moments when it was possible to see beneath the surface. You'd be walking along with her and she'd say, look at that tree, and you'd sort of notice it for the first time. Or it might be some act of kindness or an opera on the radio or some, just some vines climbing on the fire escape outside her window in the middle of a slum. Things like that that could just make her rejoice. I remember so many of her qualities, her courage, her humor, her boundless curiosity, her capacity for indignation, her fascination with detail, the personal in particular over abstract concepts, her effervescent laughter. But if there's any quality I particularly associate with Dorothy, it was gratitude. Such gratitude and happiness at the birth of her daughter that first turned her heart to God. She wrote, no human creature could receive or contain so vast a flood of love and joy as I often felt after the birth of my child. With this came the need to worship, to adore. It was this gratefulness that led to her decision to have her child baptized and to follow by joining the Catholic Church, even though this entailed great personal sacrifice. And appropriately, the words on her gravestone are Deo gratias. But as was mentioned, her gratefulness and love for the church didn't remove her awareness of its sins and failures. The church is the cross on which Christ is crucified, she liked to quote Romano Guardini. She included herself, of course, in, in that reference to the church, always praying for forgiveness and a spirit of conversion. I had the great honor of spending the past five years editing Dorothy Day's personal papers, including her diaries, The Duty of Delight, and more recently her letters just published this month, All the Way to Heaven. <clears throat> the phrase, The Duty of Delight, was a favorite of Dorothy's. She found it in a letter by the English critic John Ruskin. It recurs throughout her diary so often as to become a kind of mantra, often after a recital of drudgery or disappointment, serving to remind her of God, to find God in all things. The sorrows of daily life and the moments of joy, both of which she experienced in abundance. In the annals of the saints, Dorothy's diaries offer something unusual. The opportunity to follow almost day by day in the footsteps of a holy person. Through these writings, we can trace the movements of her spirit and her quest for God. We can see her praying for wisdom and courage in meeting the struggles of a daily life. But we also join her as she watches television and devours mystery novels and goes to movies and plays with her grandchildren and listens to the opera. As familiar as I thought I was with Dorothy's life and writings, working with both her diaries and her letters <coughs> revealed dimensions of her humanity that came as a revelation. In the letters, the most astonishing discovery were the three dozen letters to Forster Batterham from the decade before the Catholic worker, the father of her daughter, the man she liked to call her common-law husband. These letters date from the beginning of their romance in 1925 until the eve of her meeting with Peter Moran in 1932. These letters, filled with passion and even erotic energy, reflect the real depth of her love for Forster. I think of you much and dream of you every night, she writes him, and if my dreams could affect you over a long distance, I'm sure they would keep you awake. In another, my desire for you is a painful rather than pleasurable emotion. It is a ravishing hunger which makes me want you more than anything in the world and makes me feel as though I could barely exist until I saw you again. When she felt compelled to become a Catholic and forced her to refuse to get married, she separated from him. In The Long Loneliness, her memoir, she says it was literally a choice between God and man. But as the letters demonstrate, the break was not nearly as clear-cut as that. For five years, she desperately hoped and prayed that Forster would change his mind and consent to marry her. So deep was her attachment to him that she felt she had to flee New York, moving with Tamar to California, then Mexico and Florida, to resist the temptation to be with him. Do I have to be condemned to celibacy all my days just because of your pig-headedness, she wrote. The letters have an almost unbearable pathos at times. I dream of you every night, she writes from, from Florida. <clears throat> 
that I'm lying in your arms and can feel your kisses and it is torture to me, but so sweet too. And I do love you more than anything in the world. But I cannot help my religious sense, which is torture to me unless I do as I believe right. Elsewhere, the ache in my heart is intolerable at times, and sometimes for days I can feel your lips upon me waking and sleeping. It is because I love you so much that I want you to marry me. I want to be in your arms every night as I used to be and with you always. But in the end she realized that this was not to be. And as it was at this point, literally, at this point of, the, of resignation, that she met Peter Morin the very same month, as if one door closed and another opened on the rest of her life and her lifelong vocation. It was extraordinary for me to realize, on the one hand, how much this vocation depended on Forster's commitment to his own principles. If it had been up to Dorothy, she would have married him, raised a house full of children, and continued writing novels and plays. There certainly would have been no Catholic worker. God works in mysterious ways. At the same time, the story dramatizes the deep sacrifice that lay at the basis of Dorothy's vocation. It was the foundation for a lifetime of courage, perseverance, and dedication. It marked her deep sense of the heroic demands of faith. It also accounted for the high standards to which she held her friends and associates. To a former Catholic worker editor, after learning that he planned to remarry without seeking an annulment, she advised him to resign as secretary of a Catholic peace organization. This is in the 1960s. You are certainly going through the sorrowful mysteries, but if you don't go through them to the glorious, you will be a hollow man and considered an opportunist and a fraud. I am putting it as strong as I am able and hate doing it, but to me the faith is the strongest thing in my life and I can never be grateful enough for the joy I've had for the gift of my faith, my Catholicism. At the same time, Dorothy's letters to Forster amplify the point she made in her autobiography, that there was no contradiction in her mind between merely human love and higher religious aspirations. She says that while her radical friends insinuated that her turn to God because she was, quote, tired of sex, satiated, disillusioned, her true feelings were quite different. Quote, it was because through a whole love, both physical and spiritual, I came to know God. Dorothy was a witness or participant in many of the great social and ecclesial movements of her day. But her diaries are a reminder that most of any life is occupied with ordinary activities and pursuits. Inspired by her favorite saint, Therese of Lisieux, Dorothy was convinced that ordinary life was actually the true arena for holiness. Her spirituality was focused on the effort to practice forgiveness, charity, and patience with those closest at hand. Here the title, The Duty of Delight, really summarizes her approach to life. She believed that delight, like love, is a matter of discipline, a matter of the will. It's one thing to feel delight when things are delightful. It's one thing to love people who are lovable. But the heart of the gospel is adding love, even when there is no love loving the person beside us, even if that person is disagreeable. If you will to love one, if you will to see Christ in them, you can do it. That was what she believed. That didn't mean it was any easier for Dorothy than it was for the rest of us, but it was the exercise of charity in these small ways that equipped her for the extraordinary and heroic actions she performed on a wider stage. Like most holy people, she often fell short of her ideals. We know this because she herself calls attention to her faults, her impatience, her capacity for anger and self-righteousness. Thinking gloomily of the sins and shortcomings of others, she writes, it suddenly came to me to remember my own offenses, just as heinous as those of others. If I concern myself with my own sins and lament them, if I remember my own failures and lapses, I will not be resentful of others. This was most cheering and lifted the load of gloom from my mind. It makes one unhappy to judge people and happy to love them. I remember hearing the story of how someone once told Dorothy to hold her temper, and she responded, I hold more temper in one minute than you do in your entire life. <laughs> in her diary, she writes, I have a hard enough job to curb the anger in my own heart, which I sometimes even wake up with, go to sleep with, a giant to strive with, an ugliness, a sorrow to me, a mighty struggle to love. As long as there is any resentment, bitterness, 
Lack of love in my own heart, I am powerless. God must help me. The diaries offer a frank and candid picture of the strain and stresses of Catholic worker life, the overwhelming demands on her time and attention, the rebukes and resentments she faced from those in her own community, the demands of leadership. As she wrote, she often found herself in the position of a dictator trying to legislate herself out of existence. I fail people daily, she wrote. God help me, when they come to me for aid and sympathy, there are too many of them, whichever way I turn. It's not that I can do anything. I must always disappoint them and arouse their bitterness, especially when it is material things they want. But I deny them the Christ in me when I do not show them tenderness, love, God forgive me, and make, make it up to them for it. Often she refers to her temptation to simply walk away from the Catholic worker. The opposition to the work, the idea that I did not understand or interpret Peter Moore incorrectly, there's been many an occasion when I never wanted to see a CW again. But then she adds, some such thought as that of St. John of the Cross would come. Where there is no love, put love, and you will find love, and makes all right. When it comes down to it, even on the natural plane, it is much happier and more enlivening to love than to be loved. She reacted strongly against the loose sexual mores of the 1960s counterculture and resisted their intrusion at the worker. In one letter, she writes of her efforts to purge the worker of a group of beats who, quote, reversed all standards, turning night into day, and proudly proclaimed their freedom from bourgeois morality. This is not reverence for life, she said. It is a great denial and is more resembling nihilism than the revolution which they think they are furthering. At the same time, the memory of her own youthful struggles made her particularly sensitive to the searching and sufferings of youth. To a young woman in distress, she wrote, please forgive me pres for presuming to write you so personally, to intrude on you and your suffering as I am doing. But I had to, because I've gone through so much the same suffering as you in the confusion of my youth and my search for love. It is a very real agony of our own wanting human love, fulfillment, and one so easily sees all the imperfections of this love we seek the inability of others ever to satisfy this need of ours, the constant failure of those nearest and dearest to understand, to respond. Dorothy entitled the story of her conversion, The Long Loneliness. Despite her life and community, a certain loneliness remained a constant feature in her life. She writes on one hard occasion, I have had this completely alone feeling, a time when the memory and understanding fail one completely and only the will remains so that I feel hard and rigid, and at the same time ready to sit like a soft fool and weep my eyes out. In response to the insecurity, the sorrows, and drudgery of life among the insulted and injured, she tried always to remember the duty of delight. I was thinking how, as one gets older, we are tempted to sadness, knowing life as it is here on earth, the suffering, the cross, and how we must overcome it daily, growing in love and the joy which goes with loving. And through her diaries and letters, we see her gradually slowing down, adjusting after a heart attack to the end of her restless travels. She had traveled the world. She had spent much of her life, it seems, on a constant bus trip from one end of the country to the other. First, she was confined to the city, then to Mary House, and finally to her room on the second floor, where she spent much of her time gazing out the window at the life outside on East Third Street, which the Catholic worker shared with the Hell's Angels. In her youth, she writes, she had received a great revelation that for anyone attuned to the life of the mind, the future held the promise of unending fascination. And now she could observe, no matter how old I get, no matter how feeble, short of breath, incapable of walking more than a few blocks, what with heart murmurs, heart failure, emphysema perhaps, arthritis in feet and knees, with all these symptoms of age and decrepitude, my heart can still leap for joy as I read and suddenly assent to some great truth enunciated by some great mind and heart. That intense interest in life continued as she took in the world around her and rummaged increasingly in the rag bag of memory. She had always been a compulsive writer, quote, ever since I was eight years old when I wrote a serial story on a little pad of pink paper for my younger sister's entertainment, and writing was virtually the last thing to go. Toward the end, her newspaper columns reverted to short, breathless excerpts from her diary, just enough, she said, to let people know I'm still alive. 
She kept writing until a few days before her death on November 29th, 1980. It is surprising when we look back over our lives to see that the truly significant moments are relatively few. Often we don't recognize them at all, except in retrospect when we look back over the paths that they illuminated. Dorothy died almost 30 years ago this month, and yet it seems like no time at all for me. So much has her memory dominated my life since then. It seems only yesterday that we were sitting in her room in Mary House, sharing thoughts about Dostoevsky and Gandhi, listening to her stories about Eugene O'Neill and Jack Reed. She was soaked in memories. And yet her spirit of adventure, her idealism, her instinct for the heroic, always connect her in my mind with the spirit of youth. Though she grew old and bent with age, she never acquired that spirit of compromise or moral laxity that is a proverbial mark of growing up. Until the end, she was surrounded by young people, and they've continued in large numbers to be drawn to her story and inspired to take up her mission. When I met Dorothy Day many years ago, I didn't realize that this would be the crucial turning point in my life. And when she asked me to be editor of the paper, I didn't know that she was showing me my vocation and the work that would occupy me in one way or another for the rest of my life. I began editing her selected writings months after her death. 30 years later, I've just published the second volume of her personal papers. It was not evidently my vocation to make soup at the Catholic Worker, but it was evidently my vocation to edit Dorothy's writings and to bear witness to her spirit, as I hope I will continue to do for the rest of my life. More than 10 years ago, I gave a talk on the centenary of Dorothy's birth and used the occasion to lay out the cause for her case for her canonization, highlighting what I saw as her primary gifts to the church, her synthesis of charity and justice, her vindication of gospel nonviolence, her role in advancing the lay apostolate, her explication of the social implications of the incarnation. Now that cause has been endorsed by the church, a long laborious process that may one day result in her being officially called Saint Dorothy. Whatever opinion Dorothy might have had of such a process, you can be sure she would have objected to any effort to airbrush her faults and failings, to put her on a pedestal out of reach of the rest of us, to make her seem unapproachable, otherworldly, and mysterious. For me, the fundamental significance of this cause rests not just in Dorothy's own example of holiness, but in the way she held up the vocation of holiness as the common calling for all Christians. She didn't believe holiness was just for a few or for those dedicated to formal religious life. It was simply a matter of taking seriously the logic of our baptismal vows, to put off the old person and put on Christ, to grow constantly in our capacity for love through the exercise of mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. She lived out her own vocation in the Catholic worker movement, but she set an example for all Christians especially lay people, reminding us that the gospel is meant to live and challenging us to find our own unique way of living and bearing witness to it in our daily lives. Dorothy Day was a great believer in what she called the sacrament of the present moment. In each situation, in each encounter, in each task before us, she believed, there's a path to God. We don't need to be in a monastery or a chapel. We don't need to become a different person first. We can start today, this moment, where we are, to add to the balance of love in the world, to add to the balance of peace. Thank you very much. We're going to take time for questions now. We just ask that you use the microphone here in the center aisle so that we can make sure that we record your question. Thank you. Before supper, you shared a wonderful insight that I wish you would share again. Catherine Doherty knew Dorothy Day. You drew a beautiful comparison between these two giants. Would you like to share that again? I'll say a little about that since we're in Canada. Um, <laughs> Catherine DeHuick, uh, you may be 
familiar with her story. She's a great figure of, of Canada, a Russian immigrant. She was a, a, a baroness by, by birth and came to this, uh, to this country and in some way had a, uh, a parallel uh, career with, with Dorothy's in interesting ways. She, she uh, had become, it was very wealthy and then heard the gospel in this radical way and gave it all up and dedicated herself to social justice and to the poor, uh, first in Toronto. And then she moved to uh, New York and opened a, a community in, in Harlem called Friendship House, where Thomas Merton worked with her for a while. Uh, and then she came back here to, uh, to Canada. And she uh, and Dorothy were acquainted with each other from the very earliest uh, days of the worker. In fact, one of the very first letters in the book uh, is a letter to, uh, to Catherine Doherty uh, acknowledging her interest in, in the movement and, and their common uh, you know, uh, values. Uh, but they were really quite different um, kinds of people. Uh, Catherine was a dramatic, large uh, uh, person uh, who was a great you know, orator and storyteller, spellbinding kind of uh, storyteller. And Dorothy was uh, very uh, non-rhetorical in her way of, of speaking, very plain spoken. She would just kind of get up and stand there and tell uh, stories about life of the Catholic worker and still manage to have a spellbinding effect on people because of just the, the uh, evident authority and integrity of, of her witness. But uh, Catherine came to the Catholic worker to, to visit uh, the Catholic worker. She came away where she was appalled by what she thought was the disorder and the slovenliness of the Catholic worker and thought she said, you know, uh, surely God loves cleanliness and light and order. Why is there so much, uh, you know, and uh, this got back to Dorothy, and Dorothy, you know, had just pointed out to her that, that her, as far as she was concerned, to, to be with the poor, you, you know, it's like the poor you will have always, you will also have a mess and disorder. And she was not interested in hierarchy or being in control or order. And uh, uh, Catherine thought, you know, people were just sort of running wild, doing whatever they wanted, and that was Dorothy's idea of personal responsibility, that there wasn't, you know, somebody in charge uh, running everything. Uh, but they would, uh, but, you know, Catherine would also, uh, pour out her kind of own you know, struggles with Dorothy and would say, you know, Dorothy, what are we going to do about the fact that no one listens to the gospel? And, and Dorothy would say, you know, calm down, you're, you're being too dramatic. Uh, just, you know, have faith, have trust, uh, do what you need to do. And Ka Catherine, like Dorothy, also suffered, you know, persecution and, and uh, had came into troubles with the, 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 the church here in, in Canada. And, uh, Dorothy was very uh, sympathetic to all that, but it came back to Dorothy also that, that, that Catherine liked to tell a very dramatic anecdote, an apocryphal anecdote, she, she thought. She said, um, she would often in her talk say, she would always praising Dorothy Day, said, uh, one time I stayed with her, and believe it or not, Dorothy shared her bed with a syphilitic woman with horrible wounds seeping you know, from her body. And I said, Dorothy, this is, you, know, you must have more prudence. And Dorothy said to me, Catherine, you must have more faith. <laughs> and Dorothy heard this story and drove her crazy, and she said, nothing like that ever happened. I never shared a bed with a syphilitic woman. I never, I'm not crazy, and if you spread that story, the Board of Health is going to shut us down. <laughs> she said, I don't even like to share my bed with my, my daughter. She wiggles too much. Um, so they, they, in a way, uh, they were, uh, it's one of their letters, I can't remember if it's Catherine or Dorothy referred to themselves as comrades stumbling along together. And that's the uh, title of, of, a, of a collection that's been published recently here in Canada of their uh, letters between Dorothy and, and Catherine. I include Dorothy's letters in, in my volume. Uh, and, but I think that they agreed that it was probably, you know, New York was too small for the two of them. And <laughs> they did their different things, you know, and remained comrades at sort a of distance. My question, my question is about the, I guess, the beatification process, for mm -hmm. where it's at, uh, how much involvement there is on the part of the Archdiocese of New York, uh, I think it would be a, a terrifically significant uh, beatification canonization, because it would convey a, a sense of holiness that the church obviously needs, and that was so evident in your talk. But where is the process at? Um. On the centenary of, of Dorothy's uh, birth in November eight, 1997, Cardinal O'Connor uh, held a special uh, this mass at, at St. Patrick's Cathedral. I was invited to be there. 
and he dedicated this to this question of Dorothy and kind of publicly raised the question, why shouldn't Dorothy be, be canonized? You know? um, and he then invited a, a group of people who had known her, including me, uh, to meet with him uh, a couple of times. And uh, I will say that, that it was really one of the uh, most graced and beautiful, precious experiences of my life uh, to, to be part of that uh, group of about uh, eight or nine people or so. And um, I had never, you know, had much impression of Cardinal O'Connor. He seemed like kind of a loud mouth, you know, when he first arrived in New York. Like, like, like uh, he and Mayor Koch were kind of a, kind of a, had a buddy sort of show that they did together. And uh, uh, I didn't, you know, I knew that he'd been a former admiral and he was uh, kind of renowned as being sort of a hawk during the Vietnam War. Uh, I hadn't really been following, you know, his you know, kind of steady uh, conversion as, as increasingly one of the most uh, outspoken voices for peace and social justice uh, in the church. Um, and uh, evidently he was, he was truly humbled by the prospect of, of addressing this, this question. He said, um, he said, I never met Dorothy, which, you know, he came to New York after she died. Uh, he said she was a great hero, you know, when I was of my generation, all of seminarians, uh, her commitment to the poor and everything. Uh, and he specifically said her, her, her peace witness had been a, a great challenge to him and that over time he had, he had you know, grown much more to respect and understand uh, uh, the great gift that she offered with his witness. And he said, I would not want it on my conscience that I had not done what God wanted to be done. And after sort of you know, hours of going around and talking about and reflecting this, he said that he was very convinced that here was a holy woman and that he would personally take responsibility for bringing this to, to Rome, which he did. And it was one of the last things he did before he died uh, and announced that, that the, her cause had been accepted for canonization and so therefore she is elevated, if you want to call it that, to, to the title Servant of God. Um, then came Cardinal Egan uh, in New York and I have to say for about 10 years, not a whole lot really happened. Um, of course, there were other preoccupations in the church and whatnot, um, but uh, he did uh, convene a, 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 a Dorothy Day Guild was established. Uh, it was announced, it has an office in the Archdiocese, and to, to promote her you know, awareness of her, her story, to solicit prayers and that sort of thing. A postulator was, was uh, appointed for the cause, but there on the official side of things, to my knowledge, and I don't imagine there's anybody who knows more about it than I do, nothing has happened as far as I'm concerned. No one has ever, he's never approached me or, or offered, asked to see the work I've done or talk to me about it. Uh, uh, no work has been done on a biography, an official collection of her writings, uh, interviews with people who knew her who were declining in number. Um, when uh, Cardinal Dolan was uh, announced, or Archbishop Dolan, the new, new Archbishop of New York, he comes from Milwaukee, and since the diaries had just been published by uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee, I thought there was a nice little connection there. And so I sent him a copy of, of, of the book and said, you know, welcome to New York and, and hope that you will continue to, you know, uh, draw light from the example of this holy, you know, daughter of New York. And uh, a couple weeks later, I got a phone call, Robert, hey, this is Timothy Dolan, your new archbishop. And I thought, well, that's a contrast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's kind of proverbial for that sort of spontaneity and, and, and personal contact. He's just been elected president of the U.S. Catholic uh, Conference of Bishops just this week. Uh, so I know he, he, he's, a, he's a church historian. He's an uh, American church historian. He he's, he's, says he's a, a great fan of Dorothy Day, very committed to her cause. And you can see on the, on the internet there's a video of a sermon that he gave on uh, November 8th for her birthday. Uh, at, in New York City that was dedicated to her and talking about what he thought were the six great gifts of Dorothy Day uh, to the church. So evidently he's very uh, committed to that. Uh, what will happen, I don't know, these things, you know, move s slowly. But, you know, as I've said, I, I, I as, as you, s you suggested too, I think there's something, uh, you know, you, you think that the church could sometimes, you know, l look at a, at a at a PR sort of opportunity, if nothing else, and, and say, oh, you know, not just you know, here's the next saint in line to be beatified, but what is the kind of what are the kind of models of holiness that we need in this time? Here's here's a woman who was a layperson, 
and who, uh, f you know, who anticipated in so many ways the, you know, the Catholic social teaching of, of, of the church and who lived out her life among the poor, just like Mother Ter Teresa, uh, who raised the whole social consciousness of the church and generations of, of Catholics whose, whose, uh, whose reputation is much wider and, and more respected today, 30 years after her death, than it was you know, any time during her, her life. Uh, who you know, was staunchly pro-life, if you want to put it in those terms, but in the broadest sense of the kind of seamless uh, garment, uh, who anticipated in so many ways the spirit of Vatican II and the, the importance of conscience and the, 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 the importance of, of work and of freedom and religious pluralism and respect for other religions and for the Bible and for dialogue with the Jews and with the Orthodox and uh, just an end. But then, you know, the, the, the fact this was not just, you know, a model of, 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 of holiness outside of religious orders. Of, uh, here's a woman whose f conversion came about from having a baby, uh, uh, who just knew every aspect of family life, of loneliness, of community, of struggle, of, of conscience, you know. And I, I just think, you know, that, that, that her, to have that example out there put before uh, the church as a, as a model would, would, would say so much. So I, you know, it's up to me. You ask my two cents, I say, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the threads that uh, goes through Dorothy's life is her commitment to peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, many times she spent time in jail because of her mm -hmm. commitment to peace. What, what do you see from her legacy will give us words of hope and encouragement today if we face the, the, the challenges to peace throughout the world. Well, I think, you know, on, 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 on so, so many levels, I mean, Dorothy uh, was way out there in, for, in the idea of deriving, basing kind of social ethics on the words of Jesus and the teaching and the, and the, and the gospel uh, instead of the kind of casuistry of, you know, of the moral theology as it developed over, over uh, you know, a thousand years and uh, categories of Aristotle and Aquinas and whatever. She just, uh, maybe as her Protestant background or whatever, but she naively had this idea that Jesus said, love your, your, your neighbors, do good to those who, who harm you. you know, those who take up the sword will die by the sword. And she thought that kind of was sort of obvious. Uh, well, of course, it got her into a lot of trouble when she, she you know, people thought that's not Catholic at all to, to, to think that. And it was very difficult in America where in an immigrant church where American Catholics were struggling so much to be recognized as patriotic, full-blooded, you know, Americans, uh, the first to volunteer to fight in any war or whatever. Um, and it was uh, very hard for people to comprehend how it was even possible for a Catholic to take that position. In World War II, uh, draft boards you know, would not, you know, just grudgingly, only a very f few cases would they, would they allow any Catholics to be recognized as conscience objectors, because that was just considered not a Catholic position, not, not a Catholic option. Uh, so, uh, you know, finally, the, the American Catholic bishops in their pastoral letter on, on, on peace that was after Dorothy's death, uh, not very long after that, in 1982 maybe, I'm not sure, uh, recognized her in particular as somebody who had vindicated the, 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 the way of gospel nonviolence as a legitimate Catholic uh, option. Uh, they didn't say it was um, a requirement for everybody, uh, still allowed the you know, traditional just war uh, teaching as, as well, but for the first time, I think, uh, that was recognized as a, a legitimate you know, Catholic position. Now, it's not mainstream, it's not majority, it, it, Surely uh, never will be, um, but I think her 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 consistent you know position on this, uh, in you know this heroic sense of the willingness to lay down your life if it comes to that, uh, was not uh, again just she didn't feel that that was just uh, a naive counsel of you know perfection or something. She really believed that there was a practical you know aspect to this that that it was not enough just to be against war and say oh I refuse to fight in wars. Uh, she was actively working for a, a world of peace, uh, which includes reconciliation and social justice and trying to remove the causes of war, 
to try to develop effective alternatives to, 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 to war. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, embracing the, 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 the witness of Martin Luther King, uh, the methods of Gandhi, uh, the methods of Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, uh, and others you know around the world where so many, we've seen so many examples. We, we have this idea, this, 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 this kind of crazy idea that only violence works. Well, in the end of the day, violence is what works. Uh, works in, in, in to do what? In what sense? Violence can destroy things and whatever. Can it really build? I mean, the Allies were very successful in, in World War I in uh, total capitulation of, of, of Germany just to create the seeds of another world war uh, in another generation. Uh, and to what extent, you know, does victory today through, through weapons simply create the, uh, sow the seeds of, of future violence? Uh, whereas you look at so many examples in the world of South Africa or Poland or the Soviet Union or whatever, where, he, where empires have fallen uh, because of the mobilization of people's power in a way. Uh, and this was you know, pretty much what she was trying to do when she, when she refused to cooperate with the civil defense drills in New York City. At first, there were just a handful of people and it was considered an insane and crazy thing. Why would you be against civil defense? Why would you be against the possibility of protecting yourself by going underground into a, a bomb shelter to protect yourself from an H-bomb that might drop on, on New York? And she thought, well, for one thing, first of all, there's no defense against an H-bomb. Uh, two, it's uh, this, is this, this way of conditioning people into blind obedience, uh, like, you know, like rats in a maze or something, do what you're told, uh, is leading the world toward uh, disaster. What we need are more people to dissent, to, to, to rise up in a, an uprising of conscience and insanity uh, to speak out against this. That's what the world needs, not more people going into bomb shelters. And, and theologians arguing about the ethics of whether it's, it's licit to shoot someone who's trying to get into your, to your bomb shelter. There were Jesuits, you know, priests who were, who were justifying this, that, that kind of the ethics of the, sh of the bomb shelter. Uh, and then there was, you know, the way of conditioning people into the idea that war is inevitable, it's going to happen, and uh, maybe like in Dr. Strangelove or something like that, uh, you know, if there's going to be, if there's just going to be one Adam and Eve in America, we want it to be an American Adam and Eve or something like that. <laughs> um, that kind of crazy thinking, and the first, you know, there were a dozen people out there uh, marring the success of this, of this great uh, air raid drill. Uh, the next year there were a few more people, and a few more people, and finally by 1960 or 61 or something, there were thousands of people out there in the street and they scrapped the whole thing uh, for what it was worth. And that you know, kind of protest, I think, was also helped to lay the foundations later for the anti-war, anti-Vietnam uh, protest, which is the time when the Catholic bishops and the Catholic Church you know, finally, slowly, the first time began to ask more critical questions, that, that the responsibility of the Catholic is not simply to sign up for whatever war uh, the generals, the president, you know, point in the direction. Uh, but to ask, you know, uh, true questions about, about you know, justice and, and uh, greater good and that sort of thing. So um, I think that, you know, Dorothy is, uh, like, like many of the, of the saints, you know, you, you look at, at, a, uh, at a witness that she offered, and it's not necessarily that, that the whole church is going to, to, to embrace that, but to be reminded in that way of the, of the councils of the, of, the, of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, and to think for a second, gosh, maybe Jesus actually meant that in some way. Maybe that actually is supposed to, to tell us something about how we're supposed to live uh, in a way that, that involves a different set of ethical responses or instincts or reactions uh, than simply taking our cues from uh, whatever, whatever the government tells us to do. And I think that that was you know, one of the things that she offered there. Go ahead. I read a story on the internet about the, uh, the uh, chaplain in Hiroshima, yes. Nagasaki, and uh, he was speaking to the troops and, uh, and he was blessing the troops mm. for, and the uh, pilots who dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and on Hiroshima. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he wrote a book. And uh, they asked him one time, uh, you know, like, uh, what do you think of this? And uh, he said, well, like he changed after the, 
after the war was over and uh, mm. uh, so he said I was brainwashed mm. and how did you explain that? Mm. He was chaplain appointed by I say his father, George Zabelka, uh, yeah, there was a, I don't know if he ever wrote anything, but there was a beautiful interview with him where he, he was the chaplain on, on the islands down there where they, where they were preparing, the, where their flights t t took off to, to drop the bomb, whether it was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, and uh, reflecting later years how at the time, as a Catholic priest, he had, had not been trained in any way to, to, uh, to, to, to question the morality of, of of um, dropping a bomb that would kill 100,000 people at, at one time, and how uh, he had you know, come to change over time and felt that dedicated his life you know, to the cause of peace. I, um, you know, again, it, you know, I, I wrote this book, All Saints, where I, I included all kinds of offbeat sort of characters. Actually, I had a pretty good uh, record. about uh, The 365 people I wrote about, about half of them were canonized saints, and, and the others not, and, and about 30 or 40 of them have been canonized or beatified since my book came out, so, so I'm a pretty good odds uh, maker, uh, which may, maybe hope for Van Gogh and, and Mozart at this, at this rate. Um, but, uh, you know, I included, um, you know, someone like Oscar Schindler, um, you know, everybody knows him from, from Schindler's List, and you, you look at somebody like that who was, by conventional, you know, terms of moral theology, was like this, you know, this, this terrible person. He, he's, uh, uh, he drinks and he gambles and he, he's a, a adulterer. Even if you didn't include, the, you know, uh, by the way, he's also, uh, he also runs a, a factory, you know, that employs slave labor, uh, whatever. Maybe, maybe we could overlook that. But look at all this other, he's unfaithful to his wife and does he go to mass and does he, you know, eat, maybe eat meat on Friday and, and other terrible things he might have to confess if you were to go to a confessor. Um, would, uh, and here he is, what, what causes this, this person who's you know, a sinner to undertake this uh, audacious you know, escapade, risking his life, and his, his, exhausting his fortune, everything, to save people who were consigned to the, to the furnace, uh, to risk his life to save their lives, thousand of them. Um, and it you know, and then contrast that with um, Franz Jaeger's daughter, who was just beatified, uh, Austrian uh, layman, uh, peasant, who no particular education, who uh, a very devout Catholic, who believed that it was a sin to serve in Hitler's army, and did seek out moral guidance from his not only his local priest and the prison chaplain later, but but from his local bishop. He went to the town, the bishop. Ask the bishop. Now, having this crisis of conscience about this as a Catholic, I don't see how I can, how I can take an oath of allegiance to, to Hitler, and um, and the moral authorities that were available to him. And I'm not sure they'd be different, in, you know, in, in any other country in the world at that time. And this happened to be, you know, in the Third Reich. Uh, uh, all said, you know, your it's not your problem. Your responsibility as a Catholic is to provide for your family and to do your duty, you know, to your country. And the big questions are, are, are not your responsibility. And so he, you know, he went to the, he was maybe hoping that someone would talk him out of this, but this didn't convince him. Uh, like Dorothy Day, he read the gospel. He read that it is, you know, it is better to, uh, you know, far better to lose the whole world, you know. What's, what does it profit you to gain the whole world and to lose your soul? Uh, that you know that you can you can risk eternal damnation for having a, a single you know uh, mortal sin on your on your conscience, uh, and the idea of taking an oath of allegiance to to this satanic uh, government is how we saw it, uh, totally anti-Christian, uh, murderous, genocidal, war making, etc., uh, was uh, incomprehensible to him, and so he reported, turned himself in, said, "I won't serve in the army." He was tried, they tried to talk him out of it. Uh, he was beheaded. Um, and, and it was a source of embarrassment and shame to the church and to his countrymen for, for, for generations. And there's the, kind of the ironies, these amazing things that can happen in the church. Here's you know, to live to the day for a pope who took a rather different 
you know, option. Of course, he was, he was a teenager at the time, uh, uh, but nevertheless uh, had a lot more Catholic formation and education than Franz Egerstadter did, but who did take an oath of allegiance to Hitler and went on to become the Pope and lived to beatify this man, Franz Jägerstadter, uh, who, uh, you know, who died as a solitary martyr and, and, and witness all those years ago. I think it's an extraordinary uh, story. But it raises these, you know, these, these kind of questions. It's the sort of Huck Finn kind of you know, problem, Huckleberry Finn, one of my favorite books, one of the greatest books of moral theology, where Huckleberry Finn uh, finds some, thinks of himself as a bad guy, as a sinner, uh, because he is helping this slave escape, and he can't, he can't forgive himself for his depravity, uh, because in the eyes he knows, in the eyes of everything he's been taught and everything that's good and everything that's moral, he's doing the wrong thing, and somehow his relationship with this human being, uh, you know, uh, creates a kind of moral logic, you know, that that is irresistible to him that he can't he can't resist, and so he says finally. You know, he'd, he'd written, he was going to clear his conscience by writing this letter to Dear Aunt Polly, I know where your slave is and all this kind of stuff and everything. And then he looks at it and he looks at Jim and he thinks about how Jim sung to him in the raft and how he took care of him and always shared his food with him and all. And he says finally, all right, then I'll go to hell. And he tears up the letter <laughs> throws it away. There's this, you know, this question, Franz Egerstadter in the same way uh, writes to his wife and, and uh, children. I, 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 last year I published his, his writings uh, in English for the first time. And he writes and says, you know, uh, you're going to hear a lot of bad things about me. People say I'm a traitor and I'm this, that, whatever. But, you know, not everything, uh, you know, that is illegal is wrong in, in the eyes of God. And uh, I, I was happy. I sent a letter. Franz Jägerstadter's widow is still alive in her 90s, Francesca. Uh, the letters show the, you know, it pays as much tribute, I think, to her courage and faith as they do to Franz. I mean, how many wives, honestly, let's be honest, would say, sure, you go ahead, follow your conscience, oh, the kids and I will be fine. Um, <laughs> and she, what she had to endure in supporting her family, you know, on the farm by herself without her husband in a community where everybody thought her husband was either crazy or a traitor or something, and um, lives to see him, you know, beatified. Uh, presented an, you know, an urn with his ashes you know, up to the altar. And I, I, I sent her a copy of the book, and I told her about what an impact uh, Franz had had in my own life and his, his witness, his example. I got this beautiful handwritten letter saying, you know, Franz will be praying for you. And I was very, very, very touched by that. Oh. Are we done? <laughs> I think we're done. Okay, okay. thanks. Thank I'm sure if you have a question, uh, Robert will still be here for a little bit after we're finished, and maybe you can come on and talk with him. So as we bring our evening to a close, I'd like to invite Richard Cornell to come up and express thanks on all of our behalf. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> right, so stay here for the thanks. You, might well, you can stay here. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Susan. Robert, it is an honor on behalf of all of us gathered here tonight uh, for me to be able to say a few words of thanks to you. I remember very clearly the afternoon back in March when I first sent an email to you to inquire if you would be available to come and be with us here tonight. Uh, I do remember being uh, a little bit nervous when I clicked the send button. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then you replied that you'd be happy to come, and I have to admit that I did a bit of a fist pump in my office. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's a quote from Dorothy that you highlight at the beginning of the duty of the light that has stayed with me, and providentially, or something you actually have referenced in here tonight. And the quote is this, Dorothy says, If I concern myself with my own sins and lament them, if I remember my own failures and lapses, I will not be resentful of others. This was most cheering and lifted the load of gloom from my mind. It makes one unhappy to judge people and happy to love them. And for me, these words came at a very important time and were words that I needed to hear 
But what you didn't mention tonight <laughs> is that you follow up Dorothy's statement with a reflection of your own. And I think that uh, in the words that you write uh, following uh, her quote there, um, that we learn very much about the very gifted person that you are. You write, and so we are reminded too that loneliness is not, sorry, that holiness is not a state of perfection, but a faithful striving that lasts a lifetime. It is expressed primarily in small ways, day after day, through the practice of forgiveness, patience, self-sacrifice, and compassion. Robert, on behalf of everyone here tonight, thank you for being with us and for sharing us the life of both today. to a close. I'd like to thank you all for coming and just to remind you that we will resume our lecture series in January, on January the 13th to be more specific. Uh, Dr. Karen, Dr. The Reverend Dr. Karen Hamilton from the Canadian Council of Churches will be with us. So we hope to see many of you back. Have a safe journey home.